my, my reference to the icebreaker was, I don't know if you know, but I put it in the book. There's a wonderful app for kids on the Museum of London's website based around Great Fire of London. And the question is, of course, your house is about to burn. What are you going to salvage and put in the cart? And so the kids are offered various options, which they can then fill the cart up with. And we all remember Samuel Pepys. The story in the, uh, on the website is based on Samuel Pepys. His house escaped the fire, but only just. So he buried his favourite cheese in the garden to escape. <laughs> the, I imagine having a large parmesan shipped from Italy in those days was probably rather expensive. OK, well, thank you for coming. Um, I'm going to talk about the nature of modern crises, and I'll touch briefly also on those that arise in the digital world. And what I want to question and discuss with you is how we go about anticipating possible trouble, uh, how do we go about considering whether to take precautionary measures just in case, and how do we actually build up our resilience. Um, now, not everything that the media labels a crisis is a crisis. Most are just what I describe as emergencies. We have good emergency services. We're very good in this country at dealing with sudden emergencies. They're painful, they're disruptive, but kind of manageable. Whereas I don't think crisis management exists. You know, it's the crisis that manages you rather than the other way around. And the great trick is can you convert that period of crisis into manageable emergencies? Now, what do I mean when I talk about... You're all right there. I'm, there's a pillar here in our way, so I'll keep moving around. Um, what I mean by a crisis is that awful period when you lose control of events and stuff happens faster and with greater intensity than your normal way of dealing with stuff can actually cope with. And it doesn't really matter if we're talking about an individual and a personal crisis all the way up to a national, national crisis. And I describe it in the book as the rubber levers test because every lever that you try and pull to help with the situation doesn't seem to be connected with the situation on the ground. And gradually, things slip out of, out of control or spiral out of control. Now, during my civil service career, I witnessed um, this happen to a number of governments. Um, I was thinking the other day, 50 years ago, I was the uh, junior private secretary working for Lord Carrington, Peter Carrington, when he was defence secretary. And some of you will undoubtedly remember the three-day week because the Saudis had imposed an oil embargo, the price of energy had gone up four times, inflation was in high double digits. Sound familiar? <laughs> Uh, and on the nights when we didn't have electricity, we were in the office in Whitehall by candlelight, and we were studying the bulletins that came out from the Civil Contingencies Unit in the Cabinet Office, showing the stocks of coal at the, coal sp at the power stations. And you could work out from that how long the government had. Uh, and then there was an awful doom-laden evening when the uh, bulletin pointed out that somebody had been to inspect the coal stocks at the power stations and the bottom bit was waterlogged and couldn't be burnt. And therefore, the end of the Heath government was very rapidly approaching. He had figuratively and literally run out of energy. And we know what happened. There was an election early in uh, 1974 and the Labour Party got in uh, with a minority government. Again, kind of probably in today's world, <laughs> creating a certain resonance. Mm -hmm. 
I'll interrupt myself, my narrative at this point, just to point out that anyone who thinks that a minority government is probably a good outcome is mistaken. Almost nothing can get done with a minority government. It was hell in, in government to even keep the ship on you know, sailing along. There was a second election and the Labour Party got a small working majority. And then they could actually start doing stuff. So that was my first experience of watching uh, a government implode, if you like. Um, it was only six years later, I was back in the private office in a slightly more elevated position. Uh, and it was 1979, uh, and I was greeted by the then Defence Secretary, Fred Mulley, with a rather, a cheerful welcome, but a rather kind of wistful one, which is, I don't suppose we'll be working together for very long because the then Labour government was embroiled in a worsening and worsening industrial relations environment and cult. The, uh, the dead were unburied because the grave diggers were on strike. The streets of London were filled with rotting rubbish in black sacks, rather like Paris in recent, recent days. So the, the writing was, was very much on the wall. And the media dubbed this, some of you will remember it vividly, uh, the winter of discontent. And the lesson I drew from this, uh, or one of the lessons I drew from this, was about how a government manages that's in trouble manages nevertheless to convey to the public that it's still in control. And that didn't happen on that occasion. Um, famously, Prime Minister Jim Callaghan had been at a summit, a four-power summit in Guadeloupe. Uh, he'd been, made the mistake of allowing himself to be photographed, having a short break, swimming in the sea, whilst, of course, in January, the rest of us were freezing uh, back, back home, and um, uh, it was a very successful summit. He must have felt rather pleased with the outcome from a UK point of view, but uh, his political advisor, Tom McNally, had persuaded him against the advice of his head of PR that it would be a good idea to allow the journalists to talk to him at Heathrow when his plane landed. All they wanted to talk about of course, was the industrial relations crisis. Um, and famously, the Sun newspaper the following day had the banner headline, Crisis, or what crisis, exactly right, above a photograph of the Prime Minister uh, uh, enjoying himself. Now, he never actually used those words. There's been quite a lot of research into this. It was a piece of journalistic um, exaggeration but it captured, in a way that these things sometimes do, exactly the problem, that it looked as if the government wasn't really focused on the crisis. Um, and the lesson, therefore, is about leaders being seen to take crises seriously. I might come back to COVID um, in a moment. So let me just turn to a different kind of crisis. Um, it was three years later, 1982, I was principal private secretary to John Knott, who was defence secretary. Uh, we were working in his room in the House of Commons on a speech he was going to give, and this was much the most important business uh, going on, government, which was announcing that the Americans were prepared to sell us Trident D5 for our national strategic deterrent. So important work important work. Then uh, a runner arrived from Defence Intelligence, a locked briefcase, bearing three decrypts that GCHQ, my original department, GCHQ, had managed to uh, decipher Argent three Argentine naval messages. And when you put them together, it was very obvious that a task force had been, had, was at sea, uh, there'd been a covert beach reconnaissance, Port Stanley, and that by Friday, the Falkland Islands probably were going to be invaded. 
So John and I looked at each other. It was in immediately obvious this is an existential crisis for the Thatcher government. So we ran down the corridor and burst in on her. Thankfully, she was in her room in the House of Commons. And she was very good. She kind of read the messages, signals. Um, we explained what we thought they meant. And she said, you know, this is very serious, isn't it? To which there is only one reply, which is, yes, Prime Minister, uh, which is what I said. But what then happened uh, was a running meeting in her room as more and more of the senior cast around Whitehall and the military sort of joined the meeting. And almost everyone in the meeting believed she would have to resign. The humiliation of losing the Falklands, of not being prepared, uh, would be too much. Uh, so there was a real mood of pessimism. And then Henry Leach, the first sea lord, turned up uninvited, but he'd heard there was a meeting going on in his full naval rig with all the egolets and glittery bits and so on, because he'd been presenting the prizes. He struck quite a figure. And he said, in, I will moder moderate slightly what he actually said, to say, what's the point of having a bloody navy if you don't use it? The mood changed very quickly, and the idea of the task force, of sending a task force to the South Atlantic was born in the next hour's debate. Now, that gave her, Tuesday to Friday, enough time to solidify that intent into a real task force that uh, uh, she could stand up in the House of Commons on the Saturday and announce, yes, it's a disaster, yes, we're all very sorry it's happened, but we're going to put it right, the task force will be We'll put uh, rather nicely. I was uh, during the meeting. I was sent out by the first sea lord to ring the duty commander in the Ministry of Defence with the uh, historic message: "Ready the fleet for sea," which, which I duly, uh, duly uh, passed on. But the, the point is that the intelligence was too late to stop the invasion because. Falkland Islands are far too far away to sail anything there, and they're too far away in those days to fly anything there. Um, but the warning saved her government. She lost Peter Carrington, her uh, foreign secretary, who was then foreign secretary, uh, who was thrown to the wolves, and that was enough to pacify her backbenches, who were very, very cross at this. But she survived, and uh, the rest, as you say, the rest is history. But the, the message, which is that uh, in a crisis, governments for all those three, uh, uh, 73 and 79 and 82, is that you have to show that you are relentlessly focused on the crisis in hand. Um, and... Well, for example, ministers these days shouldn't duck the early COBRA meetings on COVID, for example. It's the wrong kind of leadership. It shows the, the message to those working uh, is not that it, from the top we are going to lead this. Um, and in my experience, and this would be true of business life, as the business world as well, when something like that happens, it's very difficult to get people to stop just going on with their normal daily work and to accept, no, something terrible has happened and there's going to be a new normal in due course, but nothing will ever be the same again. And you better, if you're the boss, delegate everything except the thing you really have to show you're on top of. President Zelensky has, of course, done this brilliantly. Um, and he has created the narrative of hope. Uh, but, of course, he has also done all the hard work, the very detailed, hard grind of getting, making sure Ukraine has the weapons that it needs to survive. 
Uh, Churchill did the same in 1940 with his blood, sweat and tears, but he didn't forget to get Beaverbrook, for example, to ginger up aircraft production, and had a, he had a fanatical uh, 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 approach to the, to the detail. So, um, the lead has to come from the top. Now, when I was writing the book, I was very conscious that I had more examples I could pick to illustrate uh, crisis, the, the, the nature of crisis. We've had a war in Europe. We've had an energy crisis. We've got a, still the coronavirus outbreak uh, around terrorist atrocities, massive cyber attacks, international disputes. We've even had some quite serious bank failures. Uh, and then you turn to the natural world. We had that appalling uh, earthquake in Turkey and floods and droughts and famines and so on. All of those sorts of things can have consequences very close to home. And although in talking to you and in my book, I'm very much taking, as it were, the view from, the, from government and from the centre, uh, a message I hope that comes over clearly enough in the book is that in the end all crises are local. And in the end, it's real people that get hurt. And ensuring that at the local level, there is the resilience to deal with whatever it is that comes along is really, really important. Now, one of my theses, it sounds a bit depressing, but I think we are going to face increasing problems over the next 20 years. Um, we have all the extreme weather events to look forward to. Uh, we've got real problems, I'm sure, coming in cyberspace that will have malign human uh, agency behind them. And there are always, of course, risks of, of large-scale accidents and so on. And the reason I give that slightly pessimistic uh, view is that we are more vulnerable than we have ever been before. We've seen this with the fragility of supply chains, both a bit of Brexit, a bit of the Chinese system locking up when they imposed their COVID lockdowns. We've seen that supply chains are actually very fragile. The Ukraine war, for example, completely disrupted motor car manufacture because Ukraine was the place that made the wiring harnesses for all the big manufacturers. They specialized in it they weren't available, suddenly short time working for BMW and all the Renault and all the big uh, car manufacturers. So that all needs to be rethought. So we end up with not supply chains, but supply networks with lots of different nodes. That's going to take 20 years, I think, really to... to, to uh, but if we do that, if we build resilience, at a personal, organisational and national level, then we can probably, you know, we'll live through, we'll survive uh, the shocks and learn the lessons and bounce back uh, stronger. Now, as I've said, we, we know we're in crisis when challenging events pile on faster than we can cope with. The, uh, if you have the resilience good example, perhaps, is the banking system. Uh, Silicon Valley Bank fell over very quickly. Um, if you go back 10 years to uh, a previous wave of bank failures, it would take about a week for the, those companies that had their funds invested and so on to actually get the funds out or try to get the funds out. With the Silicon Valley bank, it was under two hours, and something like 48 billion had already walked out the door, because it could be done by a handheld device. So the, the, uh, the fragility of the, our lives, uh, given uh, the uh, connectivity we all have with our devices and such like, these things are much more fragile than they used to be. And uh, Social media, for example, 
means that uh, rumor uh, or indeed disinformation uh, spreads all too, too quickly. I was looking up. Um, yeah, fa the idea of Facebook only came to Zuckerberg in 2004. And Twitter started in 2006. And the first iPhone was released here in 2007. <laughs> that is very, very recent by historical standards. Yet look at the revolution they have caused. Now you've got 40 billion internet-connected devices, from all our phones through to you know, the traffic lights in a modern city. And so the vulnerability to disruption either accidental, like the E-gates at Heathrow, at least I hope it was accidental, or to some malign cyber attack, uh, just making our lives difficult. And if you think, like President Putin clearly thinks, that what's bad for us is good for him and vice versa, it's so easy to cause trouble. I mean, it's not serious. It just means you can't get in touch with your bank or any of the services we rely on through our apps because it's been disrupted. And those, the rumors spread. Um, interesting example was Colonial Pipeline, a company in the eastern seaboard of the United States that ran the pipelines through which all the gasoline, um, all the gas for the eastern seaboard passed. They got hit with a ransomware attack locked up all their computers. Um, first they tried to hide it, then they sort of panicked uh, and paid the ransom, uh, by which time knowledge of the attack had spread on social media. What would you do? What would I do? You rush out and you fill your car up. And if you're in the United States, there are a lot of two-car or three-car families, and you fill those up too. So that entire fuel distribution system of the eastern coast of the United States ceased to function. And that was a simple criminal attack for gain, a bit of ransomware. So the capacity to create trouble, and we've seen this with COVID, vax denying uh, material spread on, on social media and, and so on. I'll just give you one example. It may be familiar to, to, to some of you, which is in 2017, six years ago, the Russians launched a serious bit of malware at the Ukrainians, trying to tie them up. Um, uh, it was called Not Petya, and uh, it was very clever. Um, it uh, was spread, the Russians got into uh, a little company that produced tax software that everyone in Ukraine uses to compile their accounts. Uh, and the idea was that by doing that, they cause a, you know, a lot of friction, as Klaus Fitz would have called it, uh, making life pretty difficult for the Ukrainians, which is clearly their intent. Unfortunately, the tax software was also used by big foreign companies that were doing business in Ukraine. So they got infected. And the most notable case was uh, Maersk, the world's biggest logistics company. Uh, and they have millions of, literally millions of containers with billions of dollars worth of stuff going in every which way around the globe. It's a huge global company. You've probably seen them even on, on our railways. You have all these containers with Maersk written on the side. Now, they got hit, and suddenly every computer screen went black. Uh, they had no access to their backed up systems because they had got infected as well. Big lesson there for those who are in charge of backing up data. Don't, whatever you do, connect the backups directly to your system. So the system got infected, the backups. Suddenly, there are millions of containers with billions of dollars worth of stuff. You have no idea what's in which container, where it's come from and where it's going. Because this is an in can only be 
an entirely automated operation. It's just too big to imagine armies of clerks, as they might have done in, uh, in uh, the Edwardian days. So suddenly this is one of the world's biggest logistic company facing extinction. It was as serious as that. Now, the, in that particular case, the gods of IT smiled on them. And they found, I think it was in Sierra Leone, they had a branch office. And there'd been a power cut. So <laughs> they hadn't been connected to the internet because there wasn't any power. And they discovered this. And they had the only copy of the specially written software to allow MERS to recover uh, their data. So the you know, instructions were sent, cut the plugs off, <laughs> everything so nobody will connect it by mistake, fly it to Heathrow where MERS had uh, the team of experts uh, uh, assembled to try and recover their system. And gradually they got back online. There's a, clearly a lesson there. Uh, there's a technical lesson which those in the IT business would well recognize. But there's a deeper lesson, which is you can't rely on luck. You can't rely on everything kind of working out. You might be the unlucky one. And uh, when they totted up the total cost of that one attack by Russia on Ukraine, it was $10 billion is what it cost global business to recover themselves, $10 billion. And all the big names, Reckitt, Beckonizer, and so on, they were all hit, including some companies in Russia itself. Uh, so clearly that had been disregarded by those who, who launched it. So that's the kind of thing, you know, guys, we've got to get, get used to. And it's why I uh, look on crisis as... A crisis is in an unstable situation. It's poised between an emergency and disaster. And if you've done the work in advance, if you've thought through some of the things that might happen, uh, you've rehearsed your, your executive team, etc., and you've got some basic resilience. A uh, good example of that was Credit Suisse. The banking system did not go to, into meltdown. Particularly, the Bank of England had just about enough resilience in the financial system. So we've avoided huge meltdown of the international financial system, which otherwise we might have had. But as I say, the, the, the crisis is poised. If we're resilient enough and we've done the preparations, with a bit of luck, then after a, a short period, once you find out what's happened and why it's happened, it becomes an emergency and, you know, the, 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 the plans come out of the cupboard and you, so you deal with it. Uh, but if you haven't done that, then the risk is you spiral downwards into disaster. And I give some examples of that um, in, in the book. So crisis survival, rather than crisis management, crisis survival is inching your way along this tightrope, as it were, um, keeping your balance, trying to avoid tipping into disaster whilst trying to reach the solid ground of uh, emergency management. Now, a key here is do you have notice of the approaching crisis? Uh, to which the answer is, well, you might if you're looking for it. But if you're not... You won't. So uh, in the book, I put in quite a lot about even with sudden impact crises that come out of a blue sky, although you can't predict when the earthquake is going to strike, the seismologists will give you some statistics. And if you're in an earthquake-prone region and that's where you built your facility as a company, you've probably got a reasonable idea of what, what, whether a, a, an earthquake is overdue and therefore whether you need to tune up your, the executive team and uh, make the necessary uh, precautions. However, even if you have 
that kind of effective warning, uh, which I regard as a loud shout for attention. Will anyone listen? And that's one of the big problems in busy government. There are lots of things that you can see that might you know, cause trouble, uh, and you have to get that message over to the leadership. And the same is true in the commercial world. Uh, so you have this uh, cry for attention, this loud cry saying something nasty may well be approaching us. Uh, and you've got to ensure you can be believed. Now, one of the things I describe in the book is the concept of the safe space. So that conversation between you know, the executives and the chief executive or the officials and the prime minister has got to be conducted away from the media, who will immediately seize on any such uh, uh, admission of potential failure. So you have to have a safe space where you ha and the right relationships, where those who are advising and the professionals and the chiefs of staff and so on in military business can actually give honest advice, saying, we think there is a, whatever the probability is, of this kind of thing happening, and these are the sorts of things you ought to be considering doing. Unfortunately, these days, it is quite difficult in government to get that kind of honest conversation but uh, one mu we must we must we must hope uh, if you take Ukraine the invasion of Ukraine it's quite clear that uh, Putin's intelligence chiefs didn't dare tell him what the real situation in public opinion in Ukraine actually was if they had he would have been mad to launch the invasion in the way he did and he's not mad uh, and he's all too rational sometimes. So my conclusion is that those advising him didn't dare tell him the truth, that uh, Zelensky would not flee Kiev, and they would rally around as a country because they believed in themselves. That's not a message, I think, that would have been welcome in the corridors of the, of the Kremlin. Now, uh, let me just, perhaps looking at the time, I want to leave some time to discuss. There's one other point I might make, which I, I make a broad distinction, I, you know, don't get hung up on it, between sudden impact crises, the, uh, the earthquakes or the severe weather events or the cyber attacks, and what I call slow burn crises. And these are the ones we should all be really worried about. These are the ones that have been festering away year after year, and it's never been quite the right time for the chief executive of the business or the prime minister or the secretary of state to grip the issue and say it's about time we really did some serious work on this because it could go wrong give you an example, junior doctors pay. So since 2008, the gap between real and money pay for the junior doctors who keep the health service hospitals running has been getting wider and wider and wider. And at some point, it was inevitable. It would be so wide that it would be intolerable to them. And then you would have a real industrial relations problem, as we've, we've, we've had. And the, the problem of slow, these slow burn crises is that by the time the crisis erupts, people lose patience, they finally say enough is enough, the problem is well nigh insoluble. Trust has almost certainly broken down and getting the thing back on the road becomes very difficult. Another slow burn example might be uh, fire-resistant cladding on high-rise buildings, where it's become clear that for years and years and years, cladding has been put on these buildings that is not safe. Uh, building regulations were a bit ambiguous. Uh, the testing that was done was not as rigorous as it should have been. 
uh, the regulations were not properly enforced. So year on year, as more buildings put up and new cladding added, the risk increases. And perhaps those in charge thought, well, with a bit of luck, it won't happen on my watch. Or perhaps just, this is just too difficult to deal with. Until, of course, you have a tragedy, and a really bad tragedy at Grenfell Tower. Then the Prime Minister's in the House of Commons, uh, large sums of money are going to have to be spent to strip off cladding. Lots of people have flats, apartments they can't sell because of the cladding. Uh, private landlords won't re replace it all. You've got a real mess. So the answer would have been to get involved, to look at that at a much, much earlier stage. Uh, the 9-11 Commission that looked into the Congressional uh, inquiry into the 9-11 attacks came up with this paradox of warning where uh, it's always too easy not to act on the warning and to think well it will be a hard sell to do something about it but once there's a bit of a crisis it'll be much easier to get the resources and to deal with it and the trouble is, the paradox of warning is, by the time you've got to that stage, you can't stop it happening and the, the, the crisis uh, takes place. So these slow burn crises are genuinely, I think, difficult. And uh, uh, sometimes, by the way, they're called rising tide crises because the change is, is so slow and gradual that it's quite difficult. But most of them, I would maintain, if you look around, you can actually see them. You can see them in companies. You can see that you know, the investment in country X made 10 years ago really ought to be cut off. Um, but it's a, it's a loss of face. If the chief executive or the prime minister or the minister was responsible for the policy and the policy is not actually delivering what it's supposed to, then it's a loss of face to say, well, I'm sorry, guys, we're going to have to change, pull our investments out from there and put it in some. But that's, we know, rationally, is what ought to happen. Um, I'm going to conclude here um, just with one sort of further thought to throw out to you. When it comes to those sorts of decisions, you know, do I actually act? Or am I just going to stand back and we'll wait a bit and see if things clarify? Um, or indeed wait for a crisis, which can be our burning platform. There are two parts of the brain that have to be engaged. And it's a single brain, because it's the chief executive or the prime minister that's having to take the decision. One part of the brain is driven by emotion and by values. And it's saying, this is the way I think this situation is, and this is what I want, need to get out of the decision. Nothing wrong with that. The other part of the brain is the rational, cold, calculating, cost benefit -y sort of calculation. This is what the situation actually is, according to the evidence. And these are the limits on what's possible in terms of time or resource or whatever. And the unfortunate decision maker has to integrate those two. They, they, they use different networks in the brain. So you've got to bring those two together. If you don't have the first, then you don't have Zelensky's narrative of survival in Ukraine. But if you don't have the second, then you haven't got the kind of calculations about the coming offensive, which mean that it might actually be successful because it's been thought through all the way. So I just offer you that. And where things go wrong, sort of, if you like, boosterism, to use a recently popular word, where things go wrong is when the emotional part dominates the rational part. On the other hand, none of us want to live in a world that is entirely you know, done on a spreadsheet. There has to be vision. So it's, it's the integration of those two. And you know, read the book, you'll find out more about my ideas on that subject. Anyway, that's quite enough from me.
Where would you like this discussion to go? We've got some time. Yeah, pl uh, yeah. Thank you very much, David. Very interesting. Hang on, I think you're going to be given a microphone. Thank you very much, yeah. uh, Sir David. A very interesting talk. Um, I wanted to ask you, you've given lots of examples of under-preparation and perhaps under-response. Do you think it's possible to over-prepare or to over-respond? And if so, how does one avoid that trap? Thanks. Yeah, it's in a sense, if I'd rather over than under if it's a serious, serious matter. Um, sometimes you get it right. I think vaccines during COVID were only possible because of a lot of investment earlier and discussion between the regulator and the companies about how would you fast track a vaccine for a really serious disease. And they'd worked that through uh, as a result of good management. Um, that saved us. Otherwise, we would have been in serious trouble. You can argue, uh, and I've written about this in, in other books, that some of what we did on counterterrorism, particularly against biological and chemical uh, attack by terrorists, they never really tried it. But we spent a lot of money on it. Uh, we trained all the emergency services together and how to respond to a chemical attack. And so I'm not, you know, I was in charge of all that. Um, I'd do it again. It took the risk off the table. I mean, the worst of the risk off the table. You could argue the same about the huge amount of concrete that got poured into Sellafield to make, and armed guards and all the rest of it. There is zero, I think, chance that terrorists could seize highly enriched nuclear material from Sellafield. Cost a lot of money, uh, and they've never tried. But then, I think I'd argue that's in deterrent terms, that's probably worthwhile. But I think the heart of your question is how do you balance competing demands? What I involved when I was doing this in, on terrorism was a combination of maxi-min and mini-max. So you want to minimize the maximum harm that the adversary can do to the population. So there are some things you really have to protect. Uh, but you can't afford to do that for very many of them. So the other part is maximizing the minimum level of assurance. You can give all of us as we travel about, use railway stations and so on. You can't turn railway stations into the sort of security you get in the airport. But you can at least do some basic stuff. So the combination of, of those two is probably what you want. But if you were asking me, did, did, has government made some mistakes in all of that? Well, of course they have. Yeah, microphone here, and then there's a question at the back. Yeah, um, thank you very much, Sir David. I, I, I know from personal experience uh, how so many government departments are very appreciative of your work at King's on the whole of government analytical community training. Thank you. Um, I've worked several times in Ukraine for the European Commission, and I saw right after the Maidan the accuracy of your point just made about how many people, it's so easy to just carry on as normal. Far too many people in the EU delegation there were carrying on as if nothing had happened. Unbelievable. And of course, that was a warning, and that gave him the, yet another green light for what happened later. My question is, who is listening to you and who isn't? Well... I would like to think, and the book I'm sure will, will, will help spread the message, that most of what I'm saying is A, common sense, and B, uh, these days with some real crises around, it will be, it will be uh, received. So I shall do my best to, to, to spread the message. For those who haven't seen it, the government, our present government, uh, Oliver Dowden in the Cabinet Office, has put online something called the National Resilience Framework. Um, it's quite a long document, quite detailed. It's not a strategy, it's not a plan, and there's no budget. But what it does do, and uh, it's well worth having a look at, is list 
page after page, all the things that by 2030 we really ought to have sorted out if we're going to be resilient for the crises to come. Now, most of it then says, you know, we will be discussing with local authorities X, or we will be doing this, we will be trying to do that. It doesn't say it's been done, and it doesn't give an answer. But at least the government has accepted <coughs> basic questions that need to be addressed. And I think that's positive. Um, so I've been arguing... I, I, yeah, and I've been arguing that uh, uh, we should all in any way we can, be pushing this point about national resilience uh, and pushing it in companies as well. Uh, start with the critical national infrastructure, energy, telecoms, health and so on, but then extend it as far as one possibly can, given the complexity of, of, of modern society. Uh, so that when bad things happen, we do bounce back. We, we have toughened up, and the same is true of individuals. Uh, I put in the book, by the way, a page which the Swedish Civil Contingencies Department kindly allowed me to borrow. They sent a pamphlet to every household in Sweden saying, what would you do if your world was turned upside down? And they had in mind Russia, but could have been any, any major contingency, uh, including lists of the things that a well-prepared well household would have in the stock cupboard. Um, and the sort of telephone numbers that it would be quite wise to have with you just in case crisis uh, strikes. So there are lots of things, uh, simple things, government can do. The big things will take time and quite a lot of money. And that will only come if we all you know, push for it and say, no, we think this is worth it. Um, the ship of state has many holes and water is coming in, and the temptation is you spend all the money fixing the little leaks, because they're in today's news, uh, rather than putting in some new engines so you can ride out the next storm. It's a convoluted metaphor, but I think you get what I mean. Yeah, at the back. Okay, thank you. Uh, just to let you know, um, quick request. My daughter's just joined the Foreign Office. Can I ask you to sign the book later? Um, my question is about quantum computing. Now, we oh, know, we know it's right. coming. I'm not a techie, by the way, so you, yeah. yeah. Um, we know it's coming. So if you were to do a pre-mortem, what would you say are the challenges and the opportunities of quantum, quantum computing? Well, one of the examples I put in the book is what would we do if China got there first? Nobody has built a working quantum computer at scale. It's an extraordinarily difficult thing to do technologically. Um, and there are bound to be lots of errors. So you need a huge amount of error correcting very advanced mathematics to do it. Nobody's yet done it. Uh, the, 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 the principles have all been demonstrated at smaller scale by the big IT companies. So there's no doubt that it's, it's doable. Just going to rather like fusion uh, uh, energy, creating energy from fusion. It's easy to do in the lab, but when you try and scale it up, it becomes rather difficult. But what happens if the Chinese get there first? That has, for example, two consequences. One, all our global financial uh, encrypted communications, all our military communications become visible the encryption on which we currently rely can be, uh, can be uh, uh, seen through by the quantum computer. It's an interesting question. Now, if you take this as an example and you anticipate that kind of future, take it back to the present, one obvious conclusion was we'd better have a little Manhattan project to build uh, quantum-resistant encryption. Another conclusion might be to say to our intelligence services, you better keep a very careful eye on Chinese technology and warn us if it looks like they've made a breakthrough that we haven't. Chances are it will be in the United States or possibly even in the UK. 
because it will probably be some lateral thinking, uh, sideways, <laughs> technological advance which will suddenly make it possible. The upside is enormous because problems that are mathematically insoluble at the moment become soluble. We've seen a little bit of this in a different sphere with AI, where three-dimensional protein folding can be unfolded, and you can be test uh, potential drugs. Uh, the recent case, for example, looking at new antibiotics. Um, which you don't need to, or rather than test a thousand substances in field trials, which would be phenomenally expensive and take a very long time, you feed it into the machine, it knows how proteins are folded, it can work out these are the two or three that are really worth spending money on. I mean, that's a huge advance. There will be uh, as yet unknown advances in all sorts of medicine, um, the uh, uh, rather like trying to speculate in 1912 where is this newfangled internal combustion engine going to end up there will be downsides and there will be upsides uh, but I, it will come at some point I'm quite sure um, the same is true of AI where the applying the approach in my book you need to look at the upside and the downside and not rush into, for example, premature regulation, which actually makes it very difficult um, to push the frontiers forward. Um, because we, the, uh, there are some things, obviously, you want to, you know, racial bias, for example, but that's, you can deal with that in the... By, uh, by training the machines. But it's very important, I think, that we don't just see it as potential disaster because AI is going to rule the world. Because it may very well be that, for example, in helping design new materials, AI is actually part of the solution to what we will need for climate change. So, you know, these things come along. Um, we've got to look at, look at them rationally with that rational part of the mind, not just the, oh, God, you know, the mankind is doomed. Um, I don't actually believe that. Yeah, we've got a question here. Yeah, please. Hi. Hi. Um, hi there. Thank you, first of all, for such a thought-provoking talk. It's been fascinating. Um, my question is actually around how you influence leaders. I'd love to hear your guidance on how best to influence, be them CEOs or leaders in government, to prioritise those slow burn issues mm. over the, the immediate crises. Yeah. Um, partly it's about having the, having the mutual trust to have the conversation. Uh, and that takes orchestration. That's one of the main jobs of the permanent secretary in a government department, is to ensure that relationships with the ministerial team who are in charge uh, are such that truth can be told both ways, including quite uncomfortable truths. So you have to set that up. I think wise chief executives in business, and I had 12 years on a board, um, recognise that there needs to be a function. Some call it the strategy department or... Uh, uh, policy department that has the license sometimes to surface some difficult questions. Um, I don't think there's a magic answer uh, to it. Just for what it's worth, just to conclude, the <laughs> what uh, most organisations have, and certainly all quoted companies have to have in their uh, annual reports, is lists of risks. So you have these, the government has a very elaborate risk register and big companies have these risk registers. And, you know, they, you read them and your f heart sinks of all the possible things that could possibly go wrong. But my advice, very simple trick, and any of you who are in a position to apply this, so I, I invite you to do it. Get a discussion, set it up. Divide the agenda into three parts. And the first part of the agenda 
is about things you can't control but might happen to you. The building next door bursts into flames. Um, there's a terrorist attack, a cyber attack. And then the question is very straightforward. When did we last rehearse our plans for that sort of incident? Uh, the second part of the agenda are about the risks that are inherent in the business we're running. If you're running the prison service, prisoners will try to escape. If you're running a commercial business, people will try to defraud you. Uh, there are things that require systems of audit and control, and then assurance statements which are given to the board saying, you know, the accounts have been properly constructed and so on. What confidence should we place, you ask, in those systems of assurance? And are some of them, such as cyber security, non-existent? You won't find many publicly quoted companies in their annual reports giving a proper account of what they're doing on cyber security. So maybe that's a bit like commercial risk and you ought to cover it. But the third, this comes to your question, the third part, and you reserve most of the time for this, are what I call the self-imposed risks. You bet the company on this massive expansion into South America or if you're a government, you've decided you're going to introduce a completely new IT system for asylum seekers or whatever it might be, I'm making that up. The, the point is if it goes wrong, then the whole future, you know, it, it could be life-threatening to the organization <coughs> itself. And the sort of questions you ask then are, who did we put in charge of that? Was it the very best person or just the person who was running that part of the business at the time? How much money did we give them? Do they have a budget? Um, when was the last time we had a full, frank and free discussion about the problems that they're experiencing? And so on. And so you, you can just imagine that third section. You have a little team that would be popping up saying... Well, we did invest in this area. Nothing's actually been produced. The overheads are quite high. You really ought to think, if you're the board, about whether you really want to keep putting money into this or not. Um, it's not a, it doesn't matter if the decision isn't made for a week or a month or possibly even years, but there'll come a point where somebody has to push it and say, um, it's time we really looked at that. Um, that, I think, go, would go some way towards identifying things that the executive team would much rather kind of not have to talk about, let alone government. Thank you. How are we doing for time? Are we okay? Another question? One more question? Yep, we've got one here. Hand in the air. Uh, thank you for your talk. I just wanted to ask, it seems to me that uh, some of the defining crises of the past few decades have really been exacerbated by, you know, a distrust of expert authority or kind of a turn away from unbiased, um, you know, uh, commentary from experts on different subjects. Things like climate change, COVID, even in Ukraine and, you know, in parts of the West, there's a real fundamental disagreement about what the significance of the event is. And I'm just wondering how you navigate that in your work and as you think about as you think back to some of these cases you brought up, whether you saw those same kind of trends or whether you think that's a relatively modern phenomenon. I think it's a modern phenomenon. In part, it's the reduction in what you might call deference to the expert, including to the military expert. Um, the, uh, in the old days, if the chief scientist had said X, you know, that's the chief scientist speaking, probably a member of the fellow of the Royal Society. There's kind of, wow, yes, take that seriously. A lot of that has slipped away, as has deference to the political class in, amongst the public. Uh, it's a social phenomenon. Um, the, I can certainly think of, uh, think of cases where Expert opinion uh, is challenged by non-experts in the wrong way. I mean, there's, there's nothing, there's no rule that says that the experts 
advice has to be taken and acted on. But what you can't do, and the same is true of a chief executive looking at a report from an engineer, what you can't do is rewrite the report to suit your own outcomes. The experts have spoken, that is the professional military advice of the chief of the general staff. You have to take it or leave it. You don't have to take it. You could decide that despite the risks that have been pointed out, you know, the prime minister is still going to go ahead with an authorise uh, some action or other. But the temptation to kind of second guess the expert. Now, in COVID, it was a slightly different problem. In COVID, it was the nature of the advice uh, that came out of the modelling that was done by the experts was very assumption dominant. So if you made certain assumptions about take-up of mask wearing and uh, social interactions and vaccine take-up and so on, you got a certain answer of what the NHS strain might look like in a month's time. If you made slightly different assumptions, you get a very different estimate. And the key to dealing with experts, whether it's uh, you know, engineers or the military, uh, police officers, doctors, is to make sure you understand you know, what are the facts on the ground that they're relying on, why are they relying on them, are they genuinely solid, what is the explanation they have uh, in the case of COVID transmission? Is it airborne? Is it contact? So what are they assuming about mode of transmission? And then you can have a debate about, well, if you change the assumptions, if we were to introduce a new policy on lockdown, what would that do to your figures? Um, so it's that kind of... But what you don't do, as I say, is I don't like that estimate. I want a different one. <laughs> that inevitably will lead you into trouble. But a good question. Right. I think we've reached the witching hour. So thank you all very much for listening so patiently. <laughs>